morning, everyone. Uh, we'll begin today with an update from Dr. Levine. Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to speak very briefly about a health update and then uh, discuss some issues regarding school reopening. Actually, I have no outbreak data of concern to convey, no new cases in the majority of the outbreaks we've been following. While Friday there were 13 new cases in the state, in the past three days there have been an average of two cases per day. We continue to closely monitor the situation around the rest of the country and especially in the surrounding region. Based on the trends that we've been seeing for some time now, I continue to believe we've come to a point in our response to this virus that allows us to bring our children back to school in a carefully considered, measured, and safe way. I was just quoted in yesterday's Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics press release calling for schools to prioritize in-person attendance for preschool through grade five and for students with special needs. And I stand by my statement of one week ago. In Vermont, this is the right time to open schools. We have achieved a stage of viral suppression that will allow us to open schools comfortably. Now to be clear, if we were in Arizona, Texas, Florida, or countless other states, we would not be having this conversation. We would likely be planning a fully remote school year. At our press conference 10 days ago, Dr. William Raska, UVM pediatric ID specialist, infectious disease specialist, and I again reviewed the data supporting our conclusions that one, younger children are less likely to transmit the SARS-CoV-2 virus, become infected, or develop severe disease. Two, that adults in a family are more likely to be the index case in an affected family, not the child. And three, school-based studies from around the world have not shown significant transmission of COVID-19 within schools. Multiple European countries who have gotten disease transmission to low levels like Vermont have enjoyed great success in reopening their schools. And it is the youngest children up to age nine who are not only at lowest risk, but stand to reap the most benefit from the in-person learning environment. As I'm sure my pediatric colleague, who's here with me today, will speak more to. Vermont essentially looks more like Europe than the rest of the United States. Of course there are risks. As a health commissioner, when I weigh the risks against the educational, developmental, social, and emotional risks for young children, I come to the same conclusion as pediatricians and education experts. Now is the right time for Vermont to restart in-person learning. We in public health hear your fears and understand your concerns. Over the past months, we've been learning from education leaders, school districts, administrators, teachers, and staff. And we've been hearing from parents about their specific concerns, pros and cons, and considerations that must be made in planning for return to school, and have been adjusting our public health and educational guidance, which has been out for six weeks accordingly. We know that one plan will not fit all, and schools are customizing their solutions to fit their specific needs. The three principles that have guided us in planning for return to school are to one, give every child a quality education, two, allow for flexibility as the situation involve, evolves, like every other aspect of this COVID pandemic, and three, look for and share innovative solutions. When I say now's the time, it is in recognition that our guidance was drafted based upon the health data as it currently looks, knowing it could change. I don't mean that we will not see new cases, clusters, or even limited outbreaks in our communities, but there are public health protocols in place for handling any such event. 
as we've demonstrated over the past months with our capacity to limit the spread of disease through testing, tracing, interviewing, and advising those who have been in close contact and possibly exposed to a person with COVID-19. When there are cases, the health department will inform communities about what is happening without compromising the health privacy of individuals. And as we are heading into flu season, there are bound to be rumors, misinformation, and coronavirus scares swirling around in schools. Please know that the health department, the agency of education, and your local school districts are committed to telling parents and communities the truth about what is happening and what actions schools, teachers, staff, parents, and students should take in order to protect everyone in the community. And please, this year more than ever, take advantage of early immunization with flu vaccine for yourself and your family. The virus is not going away, but with the continued support of Vermonters and visitors, we can continue to keep transmission of the virus to a minimum by wearing a mask when out and about, maintaining social distance from others not in our household, washing hands frequently, and staying home and away from others when we're not feeling well. We must model this behavior and teach our children these practices in school and at home. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Rebecca Bell, a pediatrician and specialist in critical care, who's also this year's president for the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Thanks, Dr. Levine um, and Governor Scott for having me. Yesterday, the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a statement asking schools to consider prioritizing in-person attendance for all students, preschool through grade five, and students of all ages with special needs. In the statement, we summarize the data around transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in children, as well as the importance of in-person learning for children's academic, social, and developmental needs. Our hope is that the summary of the current data can be useful for schools in their current planning for reopening and for schools that have already put out their plans as they periodically reassess the situation as the school year progresses. I'm not gonna read the statement word for word. I used to be a teacher myself and I know that's the worst thing I could do right now is just read a statement word for word that you have accessible to you. So instead I'm gonna spend a few moments talking about why we think this is so important. An enduring motto in my profession is that children are not just little adults. When we learn pediatric medicine, it's tempting for us to think that children have the same anatomy and physiology as adults, just in smaller packages, but that's not true. We learn that children's physiology responds uniquely to disease and that their bodies and their minds have vastly different needs from adults, hence the need for the field of pediatrics. And all of that plays a role in what we're talking about today, that we should be thinking about children and schools and COVID-19 in a different way than we're thinking about other aspects of community reopening during this pandemic. And to get even more granular, we should think about younger children differently than we're thinking about adolescents. Thankfully, as Dr. Levine has noted, young children who are typically most susceptible to respiratory viruses seem to do the best with SARS-CoV-2. They are less likely to contract the virus, less likely to become seriously ill, and less likely to transmit the virus than adults or older adolescents. That combined with the fact that this is the same population that struggles the most with remote learning makes prioritizing in-person education for our youngest students a sensible goal here in Vermont. Children and families depend on schools for more than just education. We can and should have a conversation about the outsized role our public school system plays in frankly holding our communities together and whether we as a society, given the enormous impact that educators have on our children, appropriately value the work that educators do. 
The answer is no, we do not. But that, that is the reality we're currently faced with. As pediatricians, we miss working with our educators to provide comprehensive services to families. And we're really worried about kids. I don't have statewide data to present today on the secondary impacts that COVID-19 has had on kids and families in Vermont, but I can tell you that from my experience and my pediatric colleagues' experience, that children and adolescents, especially those who are most vulnerable, are really untethered right now. They're not doing okay. The loss of structure and routine and consistent adult presence and social and emotional connection has been really upending. I know that educators know this too, which is why they are working so hard to get back to some semblance of routine and structure and connectedness this fall, and we appreciate all their efforts. That brings me to my next point. If I could choose only one mitigation strategy with respect to school safety, it would be to keep community viral transmission low. What happens in the schools is, reflect, is a reflection of what's happening in the community. The data we have now suggests that schools will most likely not be a main driver of transmission in this pandemic. They will instead mirror what's happening in the community. We keep schools safe by keeping our community safe. So while our school officials are working so hard on their plans to keep teachers and kids safe inside school walls, we have an even bigger burden to bear as members of the community in keeping our positivity rates low. That means all the stuff that we've been talking about, wearing a mask, keeping physically distant, and staying home when sick. Lastly, I want to address the very real and valid and reasonable reactions of confusion and distrust that exist from the mixed messages in response to this unprecedented and devastating pandemic. The national conversation around school reopening has raised legitimate concerns from teachers and families. And that's because much of the country is not at a place where they can safely reopen schools. But Vermont is uniquely poised to be moving towards in-person learning because our case positivity rates are so low and because we're using science to guide us. I would ask Vermonters to take their gaze off the national scene and instead look towards our local leaders, those who know our communities best, and trust that they will provide the best guidance and most importantly, adapt the guidance in response to evolving evidence. On a personal level, I want to remind folks I don't work for the state. I'm a pediatrician. I'm a parent of two young children who are now thriving now that they are full-time back in their early childhood education center. I watched their center reopen under the guidance of the health department, and that process has been very reassuring to me as a parent. As the president of the Vermont chapter of the AAP, I have frequent meetings with national pediatric leaders and heads of other state chapters, and those conversations have only reinforced my belief that the work that's being done in our state by our health department has been done with thoughtfulness, with care, with intentional collaboration, with a willingness to adapt and change in response to local data, and always with an eye towards keeping our community safe. So to summarize, one, kids are less likely to contract, get seriously sick from, and transmit the virus than adults. Younger kids even more so than adolescents. And this is the same population that benefits most from in-person learning. Number two, schools are a lot of things to a lot of people. Schools are where our children are educated, but also where they receive nutrition, developmental support, mental health support, and community connection. Kids are not doing okay without those things. Schools also play a critical role in addressing racial and social inequity. Three, Vermont's low rates of community transmission is exactly why we are talking about in-person learning. So that means keeping community transmission rates low is the key to keeping our schools safe. We all want to do what's best for children. As we continue to work collaboratively towards school reopenings, I hope that the consistently reassuring Vermont data can help schools in their reopening and their reassessment plans as the school year progresses. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Bell. Very informative. Seven weeks ago, Dr. Levine, Secretary French, and I spoke at a press conference and set a clear goal to return to in-person instruction for our kids in the fall. At the same time, we recognize how unpredictable this pandemic is and the anxiety it can and has caused. So our planning included remote learning and hybrid models as alternatives. These approaches were in our guidance for schools issued on June 17th, developed by a large group of health and education stakeholders, including experts from the Department of Health and Agency of Education, NEA members, the Superintendents Association, Principals Association, Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators, and most importantly, pediatric infectious disease experts. Our core, core principle throughout has been to give guidance that helps school districts find safe ways to provide every child with an education that is as good or better than before the pandemic. As you just heard from Dr. Levine and Dr. Bell, as well as other public and pediatric health experts, including some who are also parents of school-aged children, they encourage in-person instruction, especially for kids 10 and under. I often talk about the importance of listening to the experts and the science. So to be clear, Dr. Levine and Dr. Bell, alongside Dr. Kelso and Dr. Razka, who spoke on this issue a couple of weeks ago, are experts on the potential for spread in our communities and in school settings. They also recognize the negative social and developmental consequences of not having in-person instruction. These experts have also looked at studies from countries that have put kids back to school. Our experience with child care centers and summer camps and the capacity we have built to contain clusters and outbreaks. With this knowledge, they continue to recommend kids be in school in areas like Vermont with a low number of cases and who have the ability to quickly contain the outbreaks when they do occur. Even Dr. Fauci has recognized the importance of opening our schools in areas with low positivity rates. This is why we put an emphasis on opening for in-person instruction to the greatest extent possible, especially for younger students and those with special needs. But at the same time, we have to recognize and plan for the reality that our data could change before the start of school. And the other reality is we'll continue to see cases of COVID-19 in Vermont, and we'll also see some in our schools. We also know there's not a one-size-fits-all plan for our hundreds of schools because each are a little bit different. As well, due to our state school structure, we must also respect the local decision-making process. This is why the guidance was developed to encourage flexibility with three primary options. First, full remote learning, like what we did in the spring, but hopefully much better. Second, a hybrid model offering a mix of in-person instruction and remote learning. Or third, full in-person learning. Now, as district plans roll in, we're seeing many, but not all, starting with the hybrid model, with kids being in person only a few days a week. But there are others offering full in-person instruction. All Vermont's data and science and the expert advice would allow for more in-person instruction than many schools are currently planning. I understand the need for caution and the need for school staff, parents, and children to ease into this, to gain confidence. Just like we've turned the spigot slowly in our economic restart, it makes sense for some to start with this more conservative approach. Beginning with a hybrid model gives school staff and parents time to test the waters and work through some of the stress and anxiety that exists in a situation like this, where we know things could change and we need to be nimble. Because whichever option a district chooses, it will be new and different than normal, like this hybrid model. 
And we want schools to take the time to get this right so students can hit the ground running. With that in mind, I'll issue an executive order later this week, setting Tuesday, September 8th, as a universal start date for students. We'll also work with the legislature to change the requirements of the school calendar to give districts greater flexibility. This will give schools one to two additional weeks to work with staff, test the systems they've built, and fine tune them if needed. School districts, school boards, teachers, and administrators should take this extra time to make sure they and their hybrid and on online solutions are ready and effective so we can deliver for our children and build confidence in the public education's ability to be flexible and responsive because faith in the system is key to returning to in-person instruction. Faith in our ability to contain clusters when they pop up is important too. That's why we've worked so hard to build up a testing and tracing system that can surround and contain clusters and outbreaks before they become widespread. Because again, the reality is we're going to continue to see cases and it's possible some could involve a school but we have a proven team that's ready to act quickly to contain them. Now, I want to be clear. None of this is ideal, but it's our reality. And I know anxiety is high, even while the health data and experts clearly support in-person instruction. And I can assure you, if necessary, we will not hesitate to act to protect our students and school employees. Fortunately, Vermont is in a much better position than most other states. In fact, we're probably in a better position than any other state in the country right now to return to school. An opportunity to do what's right for our kids and families because of how successful Vermonters have been in limiting the spread of this virus. While this pandemic has created countless challenges and obstacles, we owe it to our kids and their parents to provide them with the best possible education, preferably in person, or a hybrid system that allows them to easily toggle between the two. Now, I know this won't be easy, but I have faith in educators who have a big challenge before them, but also a huge opportunity to help teach our kids about the value of being flexible, creative, and resilient and we know they are 100% committed to giving our kids the high quality education they deserve. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. or Secretary French to talk a bit more about uh, school reopening. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. Coming into August, the anxiety levels around reopening schools have increased as school and staff, parents alike, contemplate the uncertainties around reopening our schools for the fall. These uncertainties remain despite our planning at the state level and the hard work of implementation that is now occurring around the state in each school district. My home, my household is not immune from this anxiety as well. As I work in the corner of a bedroom to plan and coordinate the state's education response to this emergency, my wife, a veteran elementary school teacher, is at the dining room, making preparations for her classroom. I believe our uncertainty and anxiety about reopening schools is not caused by inadequate planning, but rather the fact that none of us alone can fully control or predict how this virus will behave in the future. This lack of control, particularly for those of us accustomed to being in control, is unsettling. What we can do is pay attention to the science, keep our assumptions realistic, and use our best judgment. To be successful, we must be flexible and be prepared to respond to what is happening, whether or not it fits our plans, because our plans are just today's best informed guess of what will happen in the future. That being said, we have learned a lot about this virus and we know what works. We have learned that if everyone does what they're supposed to do in terms of wearing a mask, washing their hands, staying home when sick, and social distancing, that together we can have the opportunity to safely reopen our schools for in-person instruction. I say we can have the opportunity to reopen our schools 
because one of the main reasons we are able to contemplate reopening our schools in Vermont is that as a state, we have adopted a disciplined approach to managing the virus and have achieved a high level of its suppression. If these conditions were different, our plans for reopening schools would look totally different. Our plans put stock in our proven ability to continue to manage the virus together as a state. Our plans to reopen schools include measures to prevent the virus from entering the operational perimeter of a school district by mandating all students and staff complete a daily health check and requiring six students and staff to stay home. Implementing stringent precautions inside a school, such as wearing of facial coverings to stop the spread of the virus if it does enter a school. And provisions to manage symptomatic students and staff during the school day. These plans acknowledge we will likely have positive cases in our schools among students and staff. This is a hard reality to accept, but it is the reality. If we can continue to maintain the high degree of suppression in our larger society, however, we can minimize the likelihood of positive cases emerging in our schools. The bottom line is that if the virus is in our communities, it will be in our schools. We all have to do our part to reopen schools by suppressing the virus in our communities. Reopening schools is not just the work of teachers and school administrators. To safely reopen our schools, everyone must wear a mask and do their part. We are building some flexibility into our instructional plans by allowing districts to utilize in-person instruction, remote learning, and some combination of the two, what we are calling hybrid instruction. This flexibility will be necessary to navigate changes in the public health conditions, but also necessary for our schools to reopen and to stay open. Based on my experience as a teacher, a principal, and a superintendent, I know that school district operations are fragile from a logistical standpoint and highly dependent on human labor since education is fundamentally a humanistic endeavor. In spite of our best plans, schools or certain grades in schools might have to close for lack of staff, such as teachers, bus drivers, and paraeducators. The decision to give school districts the flexibility in choosing among in-person, remote, or hybrid instruction is an operational necessity if we are going to maintain schools being open. And it is important that we strive to keep schools open since this stability of school activities is not only vital to our students, but also to our communities. In the coming weeks, we will continue to focus our efforts at the agency on supporting our school districts in this work. We'll be minimizing the publication of new guidance in favor of supporting the implementation of the guidance we already have. We do have a few pieces of guidance that are in the works, notably guidance on sports, uh, which will be published in the coming week or so, and guidance on student supports, including guidance on special education and social and emotional support systems. Reopening our schools will require each community to follow state guidance and apply it in their unique settings to create local solutions that best meet the needs of their students. We cannot direct specific implementation solutions from the state level since we cannot anticipate all of these local factors. We can, however, trust in the professional expertise of our educators to do what is best for all of our students. At the state level, we will work closely with school districts to support them in this work and to collect data on what is working well so we can identify opportunities to share these ideas more broadly across the state. And for our most vulnerable students, we will work with districts to ensure these students have the supports they need to be successful. This is uncharted territory and I acknowledge there's a considerable amount of uncertainty and anxiety. I'm confident we'll be successful, however, if we can follow the science and trust in our own expertise and resourcefulness. Starting school after Labor Day gives us a bit of extra time to make these preparations. Let's take advantage of this time to make sure the new school year can be as successful as possible. Thank you. With that, we'll open up to questions. We'll start in the room with Calvin. All right, uh, thank you. So, um, maybe a question for Secretary French or Governor. Um, so, we're hearing from, of course, parents and teachers that are concerned about going back to in person learning. Um, how is the state preparing for, let's just say, if some teachers don't come back, how are we preparing for a shortage in uh, educators or in person learning? 
Well, we certainly hope uh, that the hybrid plans work, uh, that we can find a way to get back to in-person instruction in this state. As I mentioned in my remarks, I, I believe we're best suited uh, out of any state in the country uh, to do this. If Vermont can't do it, uh, I, I think we're in big trouble as a country uh, because we are, again, poised with a low positivity rate to do this. Uh, but I understand the apprehension and, uh, and we want to make sure that we provide for that and maybe the hybrid uh, type of approach can do that so we can build confidence and faith in the system. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take a look uh, and take every, any approach we have to uh, to make sure that we have uh, the instruction necessary for our kids in schools. You know, we, we contemplated uh, with, our, with, with our medical reserves um, asking people uh, who might be willing uh, to step up if, uh, if there was a need. Uh, we may uh, have to resort to something like that, but I certainly hope not. I, I hope that uh, we can move forward uh, and then prove ourselves that this is safe uh, for our teachers, for our kids, for our families, and it really is the best approach. Secretary French. Now, Calvin, I think, um, as the governor mentioned, uh, uh, this flexibility that's going to be necessary is, is uh, twofold for reasons. I think one is, you know, certainly to adapt to changing health conditions, but the other is to address the, the sort of fragilities I refer to as the logistics involved with operating our school districts. Um, we had labor shortages in some areas in Vermont schools, particularly school bus drivers and some of the support personnel prior to the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, those conditions still exist. and particularly for many of our rural schools, their, uh, their operational viability or continuing ability to maintain operations is really highly dependent on some of those logistics. So I think it's important that in our state guidance, uh, we do impart some flexibility to districts. And I think the hybrid ability in particular allows districts to shift personnel who might not be available for in-person instruction, the provision, the online learning. I think the other issue is time. And um, you know, as the governor announced today, uh, to give districts some extra time at the beginning of the year, I think is really prudent at this point and necessary. Um, districts are in different stages of publishing our plans, and we know uh, staff will need additional time to work through the, actually implementing those plans. And I think that's something we're open to working with the legislature on looking at uh, the calendar issues uh, that are in the statute uh, to see what we can do to support uh, people trying to implement these very complex uh, plans in this very dynamic context. And then Governor, just one last question for you. Uh, of course, over the weekend, there was a um, protest in the mall failure that turned remarkably tense. I'm wondering, I just, what your initial thoughts are on it, and sort of the chain of events, and what happened between the pro-police supporters and Black Lives Matter protesters? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's concerning, obviously, uh, what we saw over the weekend. Um, particularly the one video uh, that seems to have gone viral uh, throughout the nation. Uh, I would hope uh, that the rest of the country uh, doesn't believe we're all uh, represented by the, uh, the uh, woman on the uh, video. But we have to acknowledge that racism exists here in, in Vermont, and uh, that was an example of it. So it ended peacefully. Um, there were uh, people talking back and forth, so I thought that was helpful. And, uh, and again, from what we've seen throughout the country, um, we in one sense did set an example of how you can have uh, alternative views uh, and, uh, and end peacefully. Uh, it really is unfortunate um, that there seems to be two sides on this because there shouldn't be. We should be together on this. Uh, racial equity is important. Uh, it's important to law enforcement uh, and, and I would say law enforcement is important uh, to, to those uh, who need um, or are advocating for more racial equity. So we should bring the two sides together um, and speak with one voice. I think that's where I hope we'll end up um, when we get through this. Uh, Stuart? Governor, uh, I'm wondering if you could comment on the, uh, the mask mandate, which is, as several have said, this reopening plan hinges on viral suppression in the community. Uh, there are now 1,700 Vermonters who have signed a petition to you saying uh, they don't buy your mask mandate uh, at all. Um, 
Is, what is your reaction to that? What would you, what would you say? Yeah, it's not, you know, it's not surprising to me. I acknowledged that uh, Friday when I issued the mandate uh, that uh, it wasn't uh, what I preferred doing, uh, that we needed to continue uh, to educate and, and guide people into making the right decisions. Um, but as I said Friday, um, the, the modeling that I'm seeing, uh, the number of cases that are growing, particularly coming from the south uh, up the east coast uh, to the northeast, is concerning to me. And uh, the more we can prepare, uh, the more we can keep our economy open, the more we can have in-person instruction in our schools. If we want to get back to normal, we're going to have to take these steps. Uh, but I get it. There are some people who just don't believe uh, that it does any good, um, that, the, uh, that uh, they're, they feel as though they're protected enough and they don't have to wear a mask. Well, again, I would advocate uh, that it's altruistic. Uh, you're helping someone else. You're not just helping yourself. It's not preserving yourself. It's preventing the spread from happening from person to person. So, again, it's not uh, the reaction uh, isn't uh, surprising to me. Um, but, uh, but I will continue to advocate, as I have, had, have done uh, for the last number of weeks and months, wearing a mask helps others. You know, if, if, if we could all do this, then uh, we'll get through this much quicker and get back to some semblance of normal. Given all that's riding on it, do you anticipate we're going to need to have some kind of a penalty uh, for those who just don't? I still uh, hope uh, that we can, we can move forward with, with guidance. Uh, and instruction and, and education, and that people will come to the realization that this is the right approach, uh, that we're seeing it throughout the country. Uh, we're seeing, uh, if, if we could do it as a country, again, we would get this through this much, much quicker. Uh, even the president has acknowledged the fact that wearing a mask uh, does good. So um, for those who are not believers, Read the, the data, look at the science, read the data, and uh, you'll come to the conclusion that it's the right thing to do. Steve? Uh, Governor? Uh, following up on Calvin's question, though, uh, in talking to several people who um, were at that uh, rally, uh, a couple of them were speakers, and they were talking about the fact that it's, it is a mixed message that's going on there. Uh, they were kind of upset that the BLM folks came in and were pretty much up in the face of everybody and trying to shout them down while they were trying to uh, get their message out, which in several cases had nothing to do really with that and was more along the lines of supporting uh, police officers. Um, so they were upset with the tactics that were being used and perhaps that drove the wedge. In fact, several of the people said we're kind of on the side of BLM, but uh, but this really made me think twice about it. Yeah, again, really unfortunate that this is becoming so polarizing because we should be all on the same team here. Um, and I understand, you know, I'm, I'm a big supporter of law enforcement. Uh, I don't believe that we should be def defunding the police at this point in time. I believe that we should be strengthening them, maybe changing uh, the way our approach uh, to law enforcement but certainly not defunding. Um, at the same time, uh, I understand, you know, as we saw uh, in the video, uh, that racism does exist. And uh, so we have to confront that. We have to accept that, and we have to do better. Uh, but uh, but I, uh, I would advocate uh, that uh, we want to uh, protect and, and, uh, and, and make sure that uh, law enforcement knows uh, that we're on their side as well. They keep us safe. Uh, it's part of public safety. You know, one of the highest priorities of any government is public safety. And uh, they're on the front lines of that. So um, it's unfortunate that, uh, that there had to be two separate groups. Um, and and uh, when I see uh, that we should be together on this issue. Uh, and finally, uh, very quickly with uh, Secretary French, uh, uh, we're hearing some uh, shortages as far as uh, teachers saying they really don't want to come back. Um, and the same goes with other staff, as you have mentioned. Uh, do you have any sort of numbers as far as uh, resignations, early retirements, maybe the FMLA? 
that situation and do you have a plan to, to kind of help some of these small districts? Yeah, we don't have the data yet, so I'm not sure there, what, to what extent it's an issue. I think, you know, there are still districts that haven't uh, published their plans yet, and I, uh, I think many will still be revising them and, and tightening them up in the coming weeks. I think we are turning that corner as we get into August where uh, the focus will be on implementation, so I expect these issues to start to emerge, um, but we don't have the data on it yet. Okay, we're going to move to the phones now. Avery Powell, WCAX. My question is for Dr. Levine. So we're seeing some national reports about COVID testing when uh, universities return in the fall and how that could potentially be a strain on the national supply. Do you see that could happen in Vermont? And how are you all preparing for that influx of students who will need to get tested? Yeah, that's a very timely question, Avery. The issue in Vermont probably will not mirror a lot of what you've been discussing because our capacity at our public health lab and our capacity at uh, our colleagues at UVM, um, at least initially when students come back and have a uh, mandatory testing protocol to undergo, uh, none of those labs will go through uh, the labs I just mentioned. Each, each college and university is uh, separately contracting with uh, commercial firms and will be dependent on them for those early results. We have, however, agreed that should there be localized outbreaks or uh, cases in various colleges uh, that would require some enhancement to testing, we would be there uh, to partner with the college or university um, and offer additional resources. At that time, it could be possible that that would impact our state testing capacity to some degree, but again, uh, that would probably not occur unless this was a major uh, college-wide outbreak um, that I don't frankly foresee in the cards at this point in time. Um, so initially, Students are coming back. They will be under a quarantine and testing protocol. That shouldn't have much of an impact on statewide testing. Over time, as the semester evolves, we'll have to reevaluate and see if there is uh, ongoing demand for state resources in addition to what the universities have already contracted with for surveillance testing during the course of their semester. Thank you. Hadley from the Valley Reporter. Hi, Governor. Can you hear me? I can. I have two questions about schools. First, with these hybrid learning models that are popping up across Vermont, does the state plan to create daycares for parents who need to work while their kids are taking remote learning days? Um. I think I'll refer to Secretary French on this. Um, I would add uh, that, uh, you know, it, it, we can look at it either way. Um, what we're experiencing right now uh, with our kids not in school, um, there are challenges for many families right now who are trying to work and trying to uh, keep their kids involved in something, whether it's um, childcare or uh, summer camps and so forth. So with the opening of school, even with a hybrid model or in um, full five-day uh, instruction, that will alleviate uh, the pressure on many families. Uh, I know Fairhaven, I think, is uh, going to five-day instruction. I think Orleans uh, is going to a five-day instruction as well. Uh, this will be a tremendous benefit uh, for many families. So it's, uh, it's whether you look at the glass half full or half empty, uh, this could uh, benefit many families as well. Secretary French. Yeah, I think the issue of child care is, is uh, really um, one of the more important logistic considerations as districts are creating their plans to reopen. You know, once again, uh, why, uh, why these solutions need to be sort of worked out at the local level, because those dynamics uh, vary significantly from community to community. I do know uh, some school districts are working on that issue uh, in partnership with private pro 
pre, uh, care providers in other districts are uh, contemplating an extension of their after school programming and so forth. Uh, but I think it remains to be seen how we resolve this issue, but I think it does underscore uh, once again how critical uh, schools uh, and the role they play in our communities um, that transcends not just the academic and social development needs of students, but also just the, the vibrancy of our communities in general. Thank you. And my second question I, I just is, like to have Secretary um, Smith come up and uh, maybe add a bit to that as far as child care is concerned. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Governor. I just wanted to add a little bit more about uh, child care. Just remember, we never shut down the child care system during the pandemic. We kept it open for essential workers, and we subsidized the, the child, child care network uh, during the pandemic so that it would be viable when we reopened uh, child care to, to everybody. We supported that with about $18 million of, uh, of funds. And now we're um, getting ready to put out an, an additional $12 million that the legislature has appropriated for uh, help in the child care system. So there is a robust child care system that we did not, and by the way, this was unique to Vermont, uh, Vermont did not let its child care system sort of shut down. It subsidized it even though it was probably limited during the height of the pandemic, but kept the infrastructure going. And now with the reopenings, uh, as we reopen the economy, as we reopen schools, we now have a infrastructure that is in place and ready to go that is somewhat equivalent to where we were the pre-pandemic, which is a testament to both um, people that work on the front lines in child care centers, but also to the state of Vermont, to the governor's leadership in making sure that we had the resources to keep these facilities open. Thank you. And, um on another topic, our superintendent here wrote a letter to parents that went viral where she explained that the reason Vermont school districts have vastly different reopening models is because the state hasn't given them enough guidance for reopening schools. So what is your response to the criticism that school districts haven't received enough guidance from the state? Well, again, um, you know, nothing's going to be perfect here. Uh, we don't uh, we don't have a, a roadmap, so to speak. Uh, but we started uh, seven weeks ago, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, with a number of different entities at the table uh, and trying to consider where we go from here. Giving guidance, uh, we're providing guidance uh, over the last seven weeks uh, to today. We'll continue to do so. Uh, and, um, and our structure in Vermont is different than some states. Um, there is uh, uh, this local con control component uh, that's uh, part of uh, our state law, and uh, so we have to uh, allow for that as well, uh, some flexibility. So again, uh, we're doing the best we can. I know the superintendents are under a great deal of stress as our teachers and students and families. Uh, we're all in this together, and, and again, it's, uh, there's, no, um, there's no perfect solution here, uh, but we're doing the best we can with what we have. And I believe getting kids back into school for in-person instruction is the best, best path forward. Secretary French. Yeah, I would just uh, echo the governor's uh, observation. I mean, this is a very stressful time for local school leaders uh, as it is for parents and students themselves. Um, we're doing our best to reconcile these issues, but at the end of the day, I think folks can count on the, the state in particular to uh, put out fairly directive guidance on the health precautions that must be implemented in schools. But when we start thinking about um, the practical application, uh, not only of the health guidance, but also uh, on the instructional response based on staffing patterns, based on the, the facilities, the grade levels, the resources, and so forth, which vary significantly from community to community. I think it does necessitate us to have some amount of flexibility built into our plan 
And uh, as the governor mentioned, we're willing to uh, be as responsive as we can to that. But at some point, uh, we have to just trust our local leaders to uh, use their best professional judgment to act, act the guidance that we can produce. All right, just a quick time check. We have uh, about an hour to go and 21 callers still to get to, so if we could just be mindful of that as we move forward, be appreciated. Eric from the Times Argus. Uh, yes, uh, this is also about schools. Uh, where did this September 8th uh, date come from? It seems like it caught some by surprise last week when they got the email asking if they'd be open to it. Some had already started their plans and had or finished their plans and were close to finishing them when they were kind of given a September 8th, this is when we're going to open date. Well, it was a, a question uh, that we put out uh, to many of the districts asking if, if this would be uh, helpful to them. Uh, I know that there's, again, a very stressful time. People are trying to put their plans together. Uh, some are ahead of others, uh, and we, uh, we had thought uh, traditionally, uh, you know, I thought about many, many years ago when we didn't start, uh, we didn't open our schools until the day after Labor Day. Uh, so um, this is in consideration of, of many of the families uh, still getting through the summer, uh, as well as uh, appreciating the fact that many of the districts uh, still need to put their plans and test their plans. Um, this doesn't mean uh, that they don't, uh, teachers and, and principals and, and the uh, superintendents aren't, aren't going to be getting their plans together and uh, trying them out, testing them out beforehand. Uh, but we thought that this might give them a little bit of extra time to test them out, make sure they're all ready to go uh, when September 8th hits and the students uh, come back into, for, for many, uh, in-person instruction that they'll be ready, and as well as for the hybrid and remote learning so that they can perfect their systems. And so is there any funding available either through the state or through the CARES Act to help maybe boost some staffing levels? Because as, as my prior colleague had mentioned, that the letter from Superintendent Neese had brought up, and Secretary French as well brought up, lack of staffing. And if getting kids into school is a priority, but schools have to then shut down because they don't have proper staffing, is there any kind of funding available to go out and hire more people to help as substitutes? Well, again, on top of the $1.8 billion we spend on education, there has been care dollars uh, that have gone uh, to education. So um, it should be a lack of resources. Secretary French? Yes, there are, as the governor mentioned, there are additional resources being deployed uh, through the CARES Act. It's primarily, primarily we call uh, the CRF, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, and then uh, through the ESSER, the Elementary Secondary Education Emergency uh, Relief. Um, it is going to be a question to a certain extent about cash flow for districts in the summer. Uh, the ESSER application has, has gone live. That was delayed a bit by some regulation at the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, the CRF is similarly complicated, but that should, that should be going out fairly quickly. So uh, districts will have additional resources, uh, you know, pegged to help them with reopening school. And uh, some of those resources could be used uh, for staffing clubs. Thank you. Wilson Ring, BAP. Um, hi, everybody. I guess it's now happy or good afternoon. Um, two questions on the school opening. Um, the science is certainly reassuring about how uh, kids in COVID, but what about all the adults who work in the school? I'm sure many, or at least some of those, would probably fall into the COVID high-risk category. Um, how do you protect them? And then secondly, assuming the reopening goes smoothly, would it eventually be up to the schools themselves to decide when they'd be comfortable getting back to the full-time instruction? And those are my questions. Um, I might uh, refer to Dr. Levine for part of the question, but I, I just want to remind uh, everyone as we've been going through this pandemic from the very start, whether it's going back to work in manufacturing facilities, construction jobs, retails, um, and so forth, um, the same types of, of basic um, protection is needed. You know, make sure you wear your mask. Uh, stay uh, physically separated from others uh, when possible. Um, you know, if, you, if you're sick, stay home. Um, there's just so many uh, times when we, we try and 
uh, contemplate what we can do better, but it really is about the basics, uh, and they still exist. So um, I, I'll let Dr. Levine elaborate on that. Thank you, Governor. So obviously it is exactly what the governor said, but it's also the comments that you've heard throughout the morning um, regarding the fact that the school is really a microcosm of the community. And we have to regard things that are happening in the school are going to be reflective of what's happening in the community. So if people are alert to the four cardinal rules that we've been talking about um, in their community life and in their home life, uh, the school should be a safer environment as well. Also, remember, uh, at least for the younger half of the school population, the uh, information we've been providing regarding the lack of transmission generally from the young to the adult, uh, which is a very important consideration. In the end, um, if, if an adult who works at a school uh, feels that they are especially vulnerable, whether it be their own health profile, uh, an immunocompromising state, uh, their age, or what have you, obviously um, those are the kinds of issues they need to bring to their own uh, physician and uh, bring it to their attention and have discussions about the wisdom of returning to the school environment or not. Uh, separate from the considerations I've just been talking about, which should make the school environment a safer place to be. Okay, thank you. And about uh, uh, getting back to school time was the second half of my question, or my second question. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, what was the question, Wilson? Um, assuming the, the getting back to school goes well, uh, would it be eventually up to the, the schools themselves to decide when they wanted to get away from hybrid education and get back into full time? Yeah, I'm, I would say that it's uh, totally up to the districts themselves. Um, the more we prove ourselves, the more confidence we have in the system. And if things go well, I would think that uh, they would uh, evolve into in-person, uh, five-day in-person instruction. Um, Okay, great. Thank you very much, as always. Mike Donahue, The Islander. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, Secretary French, uh, I've heard uh, local control several times uh, this morning at past news conferences. Sounds like it's a primary concern of this administration. I'm wondering what if school districts don't want or need the extra time, they think it's a lost time or waste and they want to get going and they don't want to wait around until September 8th, is there any possibility they'll be allowed to do it? Uh, thanks for the question, Mike. I think you know the, the details on that would really, um, to answer your question, be re really required to have the governor's order produced. And as the governor announced the intention to publish the order before the end of the week, it's hard at this point to answer that specific question. Uh, so I'm happy to come back to that once the order is published. Well, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, is the order going to be so locked in that people have to wait till September 8th? Or you must have seen a draft or something or must have consulted with them. Um, at this point in time, you know, as a result of the uh, response uh, of the districts, it doesn't appear that anyone is uh, um, unwilling to wait until September 8th. Uh, but. Uh, Flexibility is key here. Um, if we, uh, I haven't done, uh, you know, I haven't, uh, we haven't initiated the executive order at this point in time. If Secretary French finds that districts want to start early and they want that flexibility, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing why they couldn't. Um, and we might, uh, we might change the order to reflect that. But, uh, but we haven't heard any pushback uh, in terms at this point uh, in terms of wanting to start earlier than the eighth. Okay, and for Secretary French and Secretary Moore, obviously Major League Baseball didn't get off to a good start, and I understand both of you are planning to do separate orders in the coming days to cover both high school sports, but also local recreational sports going forward. Are these rules for schools and rec leagues going to be the same, or if schools are blocked, will students and coaches be able to jump to recreational leagues to participate? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, 
Yeah, as I mentioned, we expect to release guidance for high school athletics or school athletics here um, in the near future. Uh, Secretary Moore has been leading that up precisely because she had uh, ex that considerable experience organizing uh, the work around recreational sports. And the common theme is the involvement of the health department, so we do endeavor to ensure that our health guidance is consistent across um, all, all the different agencies that might be involved in producing regulation. Uh, but I think there'll be a considerable amount of consistency on this, and I think there's also uh, what we've worked to do is to um, bring the Vermont Principals Association involved uh, in, involved from the very beginning. So they're they're actually the ones that are going to be developing the specific guidelines for implementing uh, the regulation. Uh, so I think it would be a very coherent approach to uh, providing some guidance on the subject. But if they block uh, or school sports are blocked. Uh, my, I'm being told that recreational teams and leagues are certainly encouraging high school kids to come, come play with us if uh, your school shuts you down. Uh, so I guess the question is, will there be consistency in, in both orders in this case? Yes, I think the consistency, once again, is the health, health guidance approach uh, to, to all settings on athletics. Okay, thank you both very much. Appreciate it. Guy Page. Good afternoon, Governor. Would you be open to laws to allow existing education fund dollars to flow to other models like homeschooling and micro schools and maybe relax regulations uh, that promote so-called, uh, that currently promotes so-called professional daycare while discouraging traditional home daycares? You know, I've talked a lot about over the last few years about a cradle to career concept and allowing for more flexibility. Uh, so I'd be happy to have the conversation. Uh, there's been resistance to that in the legislature, uh, but you know, with this pandemic, uh, I think that it highlights the need uh, to have full, more flexibility. So I would be more than happy to have the conversation, uh, if successful in November, to have the conversation with the legislature uh, in January. I mean, I, I just think that there's all kinds of opportunities that we should explore as a result of this. And we'll learn a lot uh, as well from some of the experiences we're going through with, uh, with the remote learning uh, hybrid and uh, as well as uh, in-person instruction. But, um, how we can how we can do better uh, with the with the dollars that we have because we're spending a lot of money for education. How can we do better uh, and uh, and give kids uh, the education they de deserve and need? Thank you. Um, also, Governor, I heard your comment about Saturday's rally. Um, are you also concerned when anti-police protesters, including some dressed in threatening anti-fa riot gear? disrupt a peaceful permanent gathering of people sitting in lawn chairs. They shout down everyone. Speakers can't be heard. They yell at police and their supporters are racist. They wave signs and say, you know, you know what, the police. They rip signs out of elderly ladies' hands. You know, we're all concerned about racial equity, but do these tactics concern you? Yeah, obviously. I mean, I've, I've been a promoter of uh, respect and civility, listening to one another. I think these times warrant that uh, at this point. Uh, racism uh, has, has, is on center stage, which it should be. Uh, so we should listen uh, to that at this point in time. Um, again, I'm a, I'm a promoter, uh, advocate for law enforcement and uh, public safety in general. So uh, I'm not looking uh, to defund police. I'm looking uh, to change our approach, uh, but, uh, but we need to keep people safe on all sides of any issue. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mike Fialowski. Hi, can you hear me? You can. Okay, great. Um, I have a COVID question. Um, trying to bring it up on my phone. Okay, so thanks for your time. I have a two-part question. So the state of Vermont, as of yesterday, has one hospitalization for COVID-19. There hasn't been a death in over a month. Just four of the 56 deaths since the outbreak are under the age of 60. How do you justify the continued economic restrictions and other mandates in the face of these deaths? 
and I'll just hand it up for her. Uh, Arizona, California, Texas, Florida, New Jersey, New York, the rest of the New England states, Midwest. I mean, that could be Vermont. We're very fortunate to be in the position we are today because of all the, the approach that we've taken, um, because it could have ended up much differently. As I've said many times, two hours from here, in Boston, they had almost 9,000 deaths. Um, had 32,000 deaths in New York, New York City in, in particular, um, which is only a five hour drive. So we're not immune to that, but the approach we took, uh, I think has uh, led us to where we are today. I don't wanna lose any ground. I wanna keep moving forward. I wanna keep opening the economy. I wanna open uh, the schools for in-person instruction. And to do that, we're gonna have to take uh, steps and measures uh, to keep us go moving in the right direction, which I think has worked for us. So um, I, uh, I would just say, look at some of the other states and what they've done, and uh, tell me whether that's what you want for Vermont. Okay. And the second part of my question is, uh, does your administration know how many confirmed lab tested COVID, case, COVID cases are in each of the neighboring states? And I would add, I think that's the over death too when there's a death reported or a case reported, is that a lab-confirmed case? Uh, you may have heard stories in the news, the Washington Post reported one of them, that uh, some of the states are following different guidelines in the CDC that allow for uh, presumed cases and it kind, of, kind of a broad definition. So do you know how many confirmed cases there are in death? How many confirmed cases we have had in lab, 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 lab confirmed. Lab tested. Oh, uh, Dr. Levine. So all of the cases that we report are PCR confirmed lab cases. You know, early on, Vermont. early on, there was some confusion because um, the CDC had lumped together the PCR test, which is the one done through the nose, and serology antibody testing, which is done through the blood. Um, and we had a very tiny percentage of those lumped in with our other cases. Those have been clearly separated out now and we're only reporting the uh, PCR confirmed active cases, not serology. Uh, so that, that was a point of confusion in a number of states across the country. Uh, the other point of confusion uh, revealed by the recent experiences in uh, Manchester um, and surrounding region had to do with counting antigen tests, a different test than the PCR test. And in Vermont, we're requiring that the antigen test be confirmed with a PCR test. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, yeah, just to clarify, you're speaking to Vermont and, and some other states, right? But or we speak every, every, Everything I've said is specific to Vermont. And okay, I just want to clarify. Yeah. Okay, all right. thanks. Uh, all right, well, thank you. Yeah. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Hope you had a good weekend. Um, wanted to start with a, a clarification. I had a, a reader reach out. Uh, they contacted uh, ACDC. They weren't able, able to get a very good response. Uh, so, uh, quick follow up on the mask mandate from last week. Um, some people are concerned that weddings or other private functions are going to be considered public because, you know, they might be being held in a, you know, a, a restaurant close to the public but, you know, open for private uh, ceremony. Um, would events like that be required, be considered public and, and require a mask mandate? Yeah, gatherings uh, of up to 150, yes. Okay. Um, and then uh, just wanted a quick question here about reopening schools. Um, it's my understanding that uh, when schools closed in springtime, that many of the support staff did not qualify for unemployment, uh, particularly regular substitute teachers. Um, many of these 
support staff are, are barely making more than their minimum wage, so they you know, certainly don't have the means to just start and stop work like a, a light switch. Um, as we work to reopen schools, and, and as said, the schools may have to close at a moment's notice, I'm wondering um, what's being done to uh, prepare to financially prop up these support staff so that they're ready to come back when schools reopen. I know teachers are covered by their union, and, and so you know because of that, their salaries are pretty safe. But I'm wondering what the state's doing to to uh, prop up the support staff. I, I believe all of them were covered under the PUA, Greg. Uh, but uh, but I can maybe I'll refer to Commissioner Harrington about that. But uh, but I believe that they were covered under PUA. They may not have been covered under traditional UI, but, uh, but I think the PUA did cover them. I didn't catch the entire question. Governor, it's but, about uh, uh, some of the support staff in the schools. Um, initially, uh, there was an issue, uh, and I remember this uh, early on, that they weren't covered, uh, certainly weren't covered. Uh, teachers have been continued to be paid throughout the pandemic uh, under normal conditions uh, through through the districts and uh, the schools, but, but some of the support staff were not covered in that manner. Uh, and I'm not sure that they were uh, covered under traditional UI for some reason, but I thought that the POA uh, picked them up um, if they weren't covered by traditional UI. Sure, um, it, you know, this is the classic response of it depends, um, but uh, we refer to these as educational wages. So in statute, if someone is receiving um, uh, a wage from an educational institution and that educational institution has normal breaks in employment, whether it be for holidays or summer breaks, um, then those wages during the normal period can't be used to make somebody eligible for benefits during what is uh, a scheduled break. Yeah, th um, this, so this isn't the case in, in here. This was, uh, the teachers were continued to, uh, to be paid, uh, but there was some support staff that were not covered, uh, and, and so that they would not they would not be paid. So I think that's- So it again, depends on whether they are uh, a normal, on a normal break or whether they lost employment during the summer or during the break period. Um, and then you are correct, Governor, they are likely either, if they have lost employment um, during a time when they were um, fully scheduled to be employed, then they would either be eligible for UI or likely eligible for PUA if they didn't have enough, um, uh, enough, uh, if they were deemed monetarily ineligible for for UI, Secretary French, and yeah, I was just going to add that um, in the spring, uh, through executive order, districts were uh, mandated to maintain their payrolls as an economic stability measure. I think to the the question about uh, supporting staff going forward, um, you know, once again, I think districts have the additional financial resources through the federal dollars. Uh, but those, those are going to be local decisions relative to how they're going to staff their services. I know uh, some districts, for example, are hiring additional staff to implement the safe and healthy checks uh, for students, uh, in particular on buses. So we'll see different patterns emerging. Uh, we're trying our best to get those federal dollars out to districts to help uh, ensure that they have adequate staff to implement the guidance. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Governor. Steve Merrill. Um, hello, can you hear me? We can. Um, thank you. A uh, quick one for the doctor and a quick one for the governor, if I may. Um, uh, doctor Levine, thanks for having uh, your your folks get back to me about the uh, uh, fomites or uh, the virus uh, being viable on surfaces for 72 hours. Uh, does would that that include like uh, variations in humidity, sunlight? Uh, stuff like that, or, or should we presume at 72 hours, or maybe say add another 24 hours just to be safe? Yeah. So the study that that was referring to, I don't believe varied some of those parameters that you're talking about. So 
Um, it's more just in an indoor setting, even in a laboratory setting. The other part of that is you use the word viable, and you can use the word viable several ways. In this case, viable meaning you can detect some copies of the virus on the test that you perform, but I wouldn't want to guarantee that 100% of the time you did that, that virus was capable of actually infecting you. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and the 72 hours was on certain surfaces, and then you know other surfaces are much uh, lower amounts of time. I think what I'd want listeners to this press conference to come away with, though, is please wash your hands a lot. It will help when it comes to transferring virus from a surface to your face, mouth, what have you. But even more importantly, physically distance and wear your facial covering, because the majority of infections are going to come through the air and not through the surfaces. OK, great. Thanks, doctor. Um, Governor, um, it, it, this has to do with, with the, the prison death up here in Newport. Um, Will, will the people who allowed this man to, to suffocate, basically, when there was a full service hospital not three miles away, um, we've heard that, that the new contractor might be rehiring uh, people from the old contractor. Will these people who allowed this to happen be held personally responsible? Well, again, this man's death. you know, what I said on Friday was I'd like to see the, the investigation, the results of the investigation uh, before commenting on what would happen next um, and our responsibility. Obviously, many, many mistakes were made uh, during this whole ordeal, unfortunately, um, and, uh, and we need to do better. But, uh, but I, I'll wait for the, for the final investigation. Uh, there are a number of them uh, going on all at the same time. Uh, before we come to any conclusions about uh, responsibility by individuals. Uh, Secretary Smith. Sure. Thank, thank you, Governor, and thank you, uh, for, Steve, for the uh, question. Um, there are five external investigations either going on or completed in the death of Mr. Johnson in the, in the Newport facility. Those are the Defender General and that just recently concluded disability rights, the Secretary of State, uh, State Police, and uh, VPQHC, which uh, looks at uh, medical quality on this. I've added a sixth investigation when I asked uh, the law firm of Drowns Rackland and Martin to look at the Johnson uh, death as part of their ongoing Department of Corrections review. Um, I initially said in December, uh, but I've asked them a few weeks ago to refocus efforts more specifically on Mr. Johnson's death when I heard about this summary of the uh, Defender General's report. There, um, the, the Department of Corrections, its leadership is committed, and certainly I am committed to get to the bottom of what happened, and by state and federal statute, the organizations that I just mentioned conducting the external and independent reviews are committed as well um, to not only provide a fuller picture, but also a shine a light on the mistakes that were made. And I believe there were mistakes, as I said last week, and as the governor had just mentioned, of how a cancerous growth tumor can go undetected for so long that eventually it shuts off the airway of a of a man and he dies there's many questions to this uh, as i had said last week um, on the darm study we're coordinating with both the federal uh, authorities and the state authorities on this um, there is there was some confusion uh, i want to i want to clear that up over um, the interpretation of correction policy about what constitutes an administrative re review and what doesn't. A 2006 uh, policy that the Corrections Department states that there will be a medical and administrative review. This is in addition to the six studies, the external studies that I just had mentioned. Um, what is included in an administrative re review 
is where there is the confusion. In the past, the medical review was interpreted as an administrative review, it was combined and interpreted as the administrative review. Uh, last week, um, I had said there was not an administrative report, and there should have been. And the answer to that question is I view those as two separate reports that should be done separately, and there should have been. Uh, secondly, I think one of the mistakes that uh, we are coming to grips with in the Mr. Johnson's death in terms of the investigation, because you've been, you've been asking about will people be investigated, will people um, be looked at and their behavior, is that the Department did the Department of Corrections did divert their attention away from this investigation during the first quarter of uh, 2020. Actually, the whole agency diverted their attention away from what they particularly do um, on a day-to-day -day basis in the first quarter of 2020 based upon what I asked them to do is to focus on the response to the coronavirus. and. And as you know, I've praised the department's response to that, the possibility of saving lives of inmates um, and, and correctional workers were paramount during that time. And, I, and they did do an excellent job during that time. But that was uh, what took a backseat is the, um, the continued investigation of the circumstances of Mr. Johnson's death. And um, during that time, I, for safety purposes of the inmates and the staff, um, I had asked that we pause the DRM investigation. We have restarted that uh, investigation, and that will include a review of, uh, of Mr. Johnson's death, and the contract has been amended to make that formal. So there are now six investigations either concluded or ongoing on external investigations. Plus, I will make sure that in the future that we have two reports that are done by the Department of Corrections. One, a medical review, and two, an administrative review that will look at all aspects of behavior that are done. I think these external reports are, are needed, and they're required by state and federal law. But I also think we have to be self-reflective in the corrections department as well. But would you be okay with, with uh, them rehire another company rehiring the same people is what I'm asking. I'm, I'm not comfortable with anything being rehired, but in, in order to keep the healthcare system going, if it takes time to review every one of those people uh, as we're moving forward. And, sec and secondly, we haven't determined the fault of who is, um, who's at fault here. Um, I would say give us some time before we, uh, uh, we move some of the people around or not rehire some of the people. Sure thing. Okay. Courtney, Local 22, Local 44. <laughs> Hi, uh, my question is for Secretary French. Um, we've seen in Superintendent East's letter and other sources that um, you know some school staff have already put in letters of resignation and early retirement. I was just wondering if you could confirm you know how many resignations or early retirements or family medical leave things like that uh, requests that have come in. Yeah, I think I, I answered that earlier. Um, we don't have that data. I don't know if we necessarily would okay. see that at this point. It's a, it's a good question, I think, and you know, once again, points to some of the uh, variability that districts will need to navigate as they uh, make their plans uh, more well known in their communities. And we still have a number of districts that haven't published those plans, but it's something we'll certainly monitor. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, like rough estimate, or like you've seen a lot, you haven't seen any? I don't have a sense of it at all yet. Okay, thank you. Sean Cunningham, the Chester Telegraph. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is for Dr. Levine. Uh, it would seem that rapid um, testing and contact tracing is going to be important in keeping the schools open and safe. And, and based on its clinical trials, antigen testing could fit the bill for that need. Well, what is the Department of Health doing to help in reconciling the unusual antigen test results found in Manchester? Sure, thanks for asking the question about antigen testing. 
the um, Food and Drug Administration and the actual manufacturer of the platform that we're talking about, Kaidel. Both are independently investigating this, um, so I really have no word from them yet about what their investigation has uh, revealed. They've both taken lots of data from the machine, lot numbers, serial numbers, etc., cetera, um, and we'll just have to wait on us understanding exactly uh, what they find. But with regard to actual use of these machines, I again actually feel very positively about this equipment. If, if this problem that might be discovered isn't too severe, and um, feel that they could play a significant role in testing in the future. Whether that role be within a school, not so sure. If one looks at the uh, product's own package insert, so to speak, and looks at the recommendations of the Association of Public Health Laboratories and others, for a symptomatic person in the first five days of symptoms, in a high prevalence setting, these machines can uh, reliably deliver a positive result if the person is symptomatic from COVID-19. Um, and they might actually provide a very early uh, ability for a local school and a health department to impact what's going on in terms of spread of disease because you can make those quick decisions about isolation, contact tracing, et cetera. Um, if we're talking about today in Vermont, just putting it in a school because uh, we want to have that early warning system, um, the fact is the prevalence currently in Vermont is very low. There's a low number of people in Vermont with symptoms, uh, and we certainly wouldn't want it to be used for screening personnel at the school or students at the school uh, under those circumstances, because it would not reliably deliver uh, accurate results in that setting. So um, just to follow, you had said that um, an antigen test needs to be um, uh, confirmed by a PCR test. The, are there specific guidelines that the health department has having to do with how that's done in terms of the amount of time between the two tests? and the type of, of, um, of swab that's used, um, whether it's, it's just nasal or nasal pharyngeal? Yeah, so uh, we don't have the specific guidelines for that as a health department, uh, but they exist sort of within um, the testing community. And um, most of the PCR tests, depending on the platform, would require a nasal pharyngeal swab or a nasal swab and one would just have to be sure that you were using the appropriate swab for the platform that you were doing your testing on. Um, the time interval between should obviously be as short as possible because if you're actually trying to confirm a test, um, you want to know then and there uh, and not wait days down the road. If you are actually finding that the antigen test was negative, and you know that the antigen test has a false negative rate that's greater than the PCR test, you would want to get your PCR test at a specific interval of time. Um, if you were just screening somebody who you thought might have been in contact with someone with COVID, like that day or the day before, you might actually want to wait four to seven days to get your PCR test because it would have the li highest likelihood of being positive on that day. If, on the other hand, you were concerned about is the person positive that day or not, you wouldn't accept the negative test from the antigen test. You'd want to immediately do your PCR test. So I hope those nuances aren't confusing everybody, but uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Colin May, VT Digger. Hey, good afternoon. Sorry for the delay there. You can hear me? Yes. We can. Go ahead, Colin. Great. Uh, I have questions about uh, mask order. Uh, 
Um, I was wondering if you could talk about what were the specific weaknesses of the education policy around math? Weaknesses in education policies with the math. Well, the education policy that you were initially employing, I guess, oh, you know, was decided. I, I would say something time. more. To, yeah, time. Can you expand on that? Uh, just needed more time uh, in order to convince more people to wear them. Um, what we're seeing with the modeling uh, indicated to me uh, that uh, we're going to see uh, possibly some cases coming back towards the Northeast within the next uh, three to six weeks. And um, I just wanted to be prepared. And I thought it was, uh, it was a, a point in time uh, where it was necessary uh, to make it mandatory. Otherwise, you know, education was my preference, guidance was preference, uh, my preference. Um, but, um, but in this case, I just thought that time didn't allow for that and that we needed to take steps more immediately. And do you have a sense of what areas of the state or in what sectors of the population uh, people continue to not wear masks? It seems to me it's a, across the board. Um, it depends on the area. Um, it doesn't seem to be uh, confined to one age group um, who are resistant uh, or who conform. Um, it just, it's across the board. I, I, and, and this is just anecdotal from, from my perspective. I just see um, kids to, to, uh, to seniors uh, wearing masks, but I see them as well without masks. So uh, it doesn't, I, I don't know if there's any rhyme or reason to it. When you say it depends on the area, what do you mean by that? Uh, it depends on where it is. You mean like the, what re state or? Yeah, I mean, it just depends on, on where you are at that point in time. And do you have a sense of in what region people are following your advice more so than no, others? You know, again, it doesn't, um, I, I don't know what to, to make of it. I can go into uh, a convenience store, the same convenience store, on a Wednesday and see about 50% of the people wearing masks. Uh, but then I can go in on a Saturday and find 95% of the people in there wearing masks. So I don't know what to make of it, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and I had a specific question about sort of the, some of the outdoor guidelines and exercising guidelines. And I'm wondering if you could sort of describe, you know, we're trying to explain to readers uh, ahead of Friday's order what uh, what it actually all means. When are people, like what constitutes public in terms of outdoors and when are people expected to wear masks? It's, I'd say within, if you're within six feet uh, of someone else, um, then you should be, and you can't physically distance yourself, you should be wearing a mask. And what if there's a situation like a, a path where you're likely to come in within six feet to someone at some point, but for the vast majority of that time, you're not going to be within six feet of someone? I would keep your mask with you uh, in case someone wants to engage in a conversation, stops to let you by, you can put your mask up uh, and uh, mask up while you're passing someone. Just be respectful of others. Got it. Thanks so much, Governor. Chris Mays, Brownville Reformer. Good afternoon. I'm just wondering um, if you guys are talking about or considering any kind of um, hazard pay or, or, or um, other benefit for, for teachers. I'm seeing there's a little bit of anxiety for teachers going back. And I know there was something done for essential workers um, that was passed by legislature. I was wondering if that's um, being talked about at all right now. Um, not that I am aware of, uh, Chris. Um, the hazard pay uh, was passed by the legislature. As you remember, it was um, encompassed a, a number more of people and entities uh, in the beginning, and, um, and they didn't all qualify. So this was pared down to just health care workers uh, that would qualify under the CARES Act. Uh, so um, I'm not, sh I, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure if there's any conversations going on with teachers and whether they'd even qualify under the CARES Act. All right, and then um, this might be for Secretary French. Um, 
you talked earlier about the, the um, CARES Act funding going to help with resources in schools. Do you, do you anticipate any of that money might be used to sort of um, help with counseling with teachers or staff members who might be really nervous or scared about returning to school? Well, there's a couple different uh, pots of money on the CARES Act. The CRF funds are largely, uh, the way I refer to them often, is a sort of a reimbursement for COVID-related expenses. And you know the acceptable uses or the allowable uses of those funds are delineated by the U.S. Department of Treasury. I, what you're describing to me doesn't sound like it would qualify for CRF funding. Uh, ESSER funding, on the other hand, is uh, directed directly to school districts, and they can use those funds in accordance with any of the current federal education policies. So to the extent of uh, what you're describing might be considered uh, professional development or uh, some broader support framework for teachers, it, it might. It depends on how districts uh, put that program together. All right, and is there anything um, that the state might offer in terms of resourcing with, with that kind of, in that line? Uh, we don't currently have additional funds for that. We do have uh, a set aside at the state level under ESSER of approximately $3 million. Uh, we're reserving the better part of that to focus on uh, supporting students in terms of uh, mental health and so forth. Uh, we think that will be an emerging need, and uh, we want to be having some uh, funds at the state available to uh, direct that to some uh, regional solutions, because no doubt those solutions are going to have to be developed uh, to, to adapt to this very unique environment. OK, Chris, I think we need to move on. All right, that, thank you. All right, uh, we've got 15 more minutes before 1 o'clock and 10 more callers to get through, so we can just be mindful of that. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, thank you, Ethan. <clears throat> Governor, you and Dr. Levine and Bell laid out a really compelling case for person instruction. And they also mentioned the European model, some of which split it up between the older students and younger students. And you also had a very successful, uh, the way you uh, closed the economy and then reopened it, it's received wide praise, it's been very successful. And yet this plan, the school plan, seems very balkanized here, and that's created a lot of concern. And as you know, uh, the economy is not going to work well if, there, if some school districts are doing one thing and uh, children are home and parents who have to work usually have to be home. And I'm not clear on, on why you didn't have a unified plan like you did for the economy, especially since the data that you're citing seems to compel uh, in-person instruction full time, it, and as much of Europe is doing right now. Yeah, well, the school structure in Vermont is much different uh, than probably in Europe. Um, certainly our, our economy is different than our school structure and having more local control and local decision making is important uh, to Vermonters. Uh, so accepting that premise, uh, we thought uh, giving some flexibility uh, to those in different areas because not every school is the same. And having the districts understand their schools better than we would on a state level uh, seemed to be the right, uh, uh, right uh, uh, track to take. Um, now having said that, uh, I believe that once we get moving forward, uh, and having different districts uh, taking different approaches uh, would give some uh, confidence to others if they're successful in moving forward with more in-person instruction. That's the goal from my perspective is everyone having enough confidence in the system so that we get to a point where we have five day a week in-person instruction for our kids. Is there, do you have a, a, a time frame for when that would happen, or is it just I don't, I don't be, think uh, you can put a time frame on it. Uh, you know, <laughs> confidence uh, and uh, proving yourself sometimes takes time. And, uh, but the sooner we get at it, uh, the sooner uh, we'll get there. Uh, I'm confident in our team and the approach we're taking and uh, giving some flexibility, I think, uh, gives uh, at least some flexibility, again, to uh, the districts to do what they think is right. So that all lends itself, I, I think, to having more confidence in the system in the end. How about, what would you tell the parents who are, are both working, or there's a, you know, the, whatever adults are working in the household, what, what do you tell them if they know that two or three days a week their kids are going to be home? Tim, what are they doing now? Well, in, in the, the way, it, the way it, it, when you shut down the economy, basically everybody was home. 
But what are they doing yeah, today, they, like today? We have a, we're at 50% across the board. What are they doing today that's going to be different um, like a month or a month and a half from now? Well, there are summer camps, there are, you know, the parents are on vacation and that sort of thing. So the summer has a different structure than, than the fall does and the way the economy works as well. I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking again as the glass half full. I think there are going to be in different areas. Uh, I think this is going to be helpful uh, to parents uh, and, then, and others. With uh, We're going to have to continue to work remotely. We're going to have to continue to ask employers to be flexible as well. And then uh, when we gain enough confidence and, and we can get people and get our kids back to uh, five day uh, per week in-person instruction, uh, then we'll be better off. But I don't think you can force this, uh, Tim. Uh, because uh, you'll, I mean, that's what's happened on the federal level I mean, with the president making the statement uh, that we're going to open up schools. I think that that set up the confrontation that drove the wedge. Um, and so that approach doesn't work. And uh, we need to take a different approach and prove ourselves. All right. Thank you, Governor. Andrew McGregor, Caledonia Record. Yeah, good afternoon, Governor. Uh, thank you for taking all our questions. Um, uh, there have been numerous instances recently, uh, comments and presentations during these conferences about the importance of in-person education and now the uh, focus on the younger students. Do you feel like you need to persuade uh, people to this fact, whether it be school boards, administrators, teachers, families, all of the above? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, Andrew, I think that that's you know, there, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, again, there's no playbook here. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of trepidation uh, as to what this will mean. I mean, we're talking about kids and we're talking about individual lives. And, and so there's, uh, I, I get the fear. Uh, and so uh, convincing uh, and showing that what we're doing makes sense, uh, I think takes a little bit of time. And that's why we've given this flexibility and not tried to force the situation. Just, a, and is just there, more of a, a gentle nudge. And is there, uh, you know, uh, is there one group in particular that, that you're focusing on? I, I mean, are you sensing resistance from, from administrators and school boards to, uh, to a full in-person, or is it more the, Again, uh, the I, public? I think, or? You know, th across the board, I think there um, is some fear, uh, but, uh, but I would have to say it seems as though, from my perspective, uh, more from the teachers than anyone else. Uh, older population in some uh, cases, and uh, I think that's where I'm seeing uh, most of the fear. Okay, and um, uh, just a couple of quick finer points for Secretary French, I guess. Um, I know the order hasn't even uh, been published yet, um, and some of this was addressed with Mike's questions earlier, but um, will the September 8th start date apply to private and independent schools? And um, is this just a shift of the, of the full calendar, or is there going to be a reduction in school days? Yeah, to your point, I think the devil's in the details on it. It's something we'll be working on this week. Um, the independent schools function a little different under statute, so uh, we'll have to you know, fall back on how we can work with the statute to enact this. Um, but I think the force of the order now would essentially push uh, the calendar back. Uh, as the governor mentioned earlier, we intend to work with the legislature uh, to address the issue, the larger issues of calendar uh, and how time is used in the school day. Yeah, because um, that raises an issue that one of our local superintendents brought up with us, that if the, the calendar is shifted, uh, but the number of school days stays the same, there'll be an issue with um, certain members of staff being asked to work out beyond their existing contract. Right. I mean, and there's, there's some flexibility now at the local level to move uh, in-service days, uh, you know, around uh, if they wanted to take advantage of the extra time to bring teachers in, that's certainly a possibility. But I think the order does provoke the larger conversation around the calendar, and as, as the governor mentioned, that's one we're interested in having. Okay, thanks. John Dillon, DPR. Thank you. Um, governor, you, you've talked to, you just, just mentioned uh, here among teachers and older teachers uh, with the return of students to school. Can you address, or, or maybe Dr. Levine address the direct concern that they have about their own health? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a place where people will be together uh, 
in, in, in common areas and even with all the precautions there is a risk and that's that's why we're seeing staff not willing to go back um, what how can you reassure students I mean sorry teachers and bus drivers and staffers that it's safe Yeah, thanks for that question. Without going into laborious detail, um, the public health guidance that the schools have received is quite comprehensive. And um, it first of all assures that sick individuals won't be in the building. Um, there are symptom checks, there are temperature checks. Um, the adults and the children uh, should be relatively healthy who are in the setting. Second of all, within the walls of the school, the rules are the same as they are in the rest of society. So in addition to not showing up if you're ill, there'll be plenty of opportunities for use of uh, sinks and hand washing and uh, sanitizer. There'll also be masking for the entire population within the school. Uh, and we've learned a lot. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Bell, was telling me earlier about even in the child camps. Um, Children are quite resilient and can meet new norms of behaviors uh, if they understand what's expected of them. And then the physical distancing aspects. So again, it doesn't take unusual protections. It takes the standard level of protections to really help all those in the school environment. On top of that, though, uh, what you've alluded to is something I did refer to earlier. There are people who may feel they are especially vulnerable, not just because they're an adult, but because they're an adult of a certain age or with a certain uh, medical makeup, if you will, uh, that makes them feel more vulnerable than others. They all have physicians and um, can be conferring and consulting with them and understanding how best to mitigate and manage the risk that they might have um, in that setting. So I think, you know, um, as the governor's been saying, we understand in many cases there are well-grounded fears and anxieties um, and they're not too dissimilar from those that other members of society have in other settings that aren't at even schools. Um, but hopefully armed with all that I've mentioned, plus the data that we've provided regarding uh, how virus is or is not transmitted from one generation to another, uh, will at least help manage this uh, anxiety to the greatest degree possible. Thank you. Kevin McCollum, seven days. Hi, Governor. Can you hear me? I can. If I could just follow up on John's question about uh, the concerns people have about returning to school. Will all school districts be required to offer remote learning options for families that may not be comfortable yet with all of the um, procedures and guidelines that Dr. Levine just outlined, or is that something that's going to be flexible for the district? I know we've been talking about that. I'll let Secretary French uh, speak about that further. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think, you know, school districts firstly are responsible for educating all their students. Uh, you know, certainly parents can elect for homeschooling. And we're giving school districts some tools, uh, you know, in terms of giving them some flexibility around in-person, uh, remote, and hybrid instruction. So I think, you know, as much as we are emphasizing the in-person, we know that remote learning will need to still be in the toolkit of schools, uh, particularly if we have changes in the virus uh, conditions that warrant it, uh, but also, as I mentioned, some of the logistical concerns of maintaining operations. So I think all districts were sending that message, uh, certainly a focus on in-person, but they need to continue to improve their remote learning possibilities. Uh, so all districts should have some capacity in that regard. And I think you know they, they, that varies to a certain extent around the state. Uh, we've worked to put some common infrastructure in over the summer. Um, but I think you know most districts in the state, if not all, will be able to provide remote learning of some sort to uh, most parents. And, but that sounds like a no. 
It sounds like there's there's going to be resources for districts to do that, but they won't be required to offer that uh, possibility. Well, I think once again, it's it's uh, you know the district's going to articulate what its plan is, and then parents uh, can assess that and, and also work with their school boards uh, to give input into whether that would work for them. And then parents ultimately have some options available to them and ultimately homeschooling. Okay. All right. So the state guidance is not requiring remote learning as of the start date. It, 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 I, I think I'm hearing that properly, right? That's correct. You know, the guidance is formulated to basically make uh, and allow hybrid learning uh, to be permissible. Uh, so we, you know, that's the basic the ground, the grounding of our guidance. It basically examines our attendance regulations and so forth, and says, look, you districts can can uh, provision remote learning in person and hybrid. Um, and so it makes it permissible. Um, you know, what we're seeing now, and which has, you know, caused a lot of the, uh, the hard work that's going on and the anxiety, is how district provision that will vary from district to district. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I just imagine that some of the spike in homeschooling requests is directly due to the fact that remote learning is not going to be guaranteed in districts. And so people are, are concerned about that and are taking proactive efforts to sort of say, well, if there's not going to be remote learning in my district necessarily, I'm going to make sure there's going to be remote learning and I'm going to teach my kid at home this year. Yeah, I think it's also a function of parents assessing what is the remote learning. I mean, not all remote learning is equal. So uh, parents need to understand what exactly is being proposed and how it will be proposed. Um, but we are, as I mentioned, we are seeing an increase in the homeschooling numbers. I will say that trend um, seems to have, have increased uh, prior to us releasing the hybrid uh, learning guidance. So I, I'm not sure how, what the impact of that will be, uh, but I suspect uh, a lot of the interest in homeschooling was um, based on a, a, what was appearing to be a choice between in-person or not. And um, with hybrid on the table, I think districts are, are producing more options for parents. So it remains to be seen to what extent that trend in homeschooling will remain. Okay, thanks very much. And the only other question is for the governor and governor that uh, what's your uh, take on the uh, debate in Washington about extending the $600 um, unemployment benefits? Uh, obviously, Republicans are trying to shave that down to something more like two. Democrats want to extend it through the end of the year. If you had your druthers and you could wave a magic wand, would you would you continue those benefits, or do you worry that those are dissuading people from getting back in the workforce? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, I do believe that uh, there should be something there, uh, and I and I also believe they'll come to some agreement on this and it'll be somewhere between 200 and 600. Um, but I think it is needed uh, for many families, for many individuals, uh, because this has uh, been long-term and obviously widespread. So uh, I'd like to see something. I don't think it should be at the $600 level, um, but, uh, but I do believe that there, there needs to be some supplement uh, to existing uh, unemployment benefits. Why don't you think it should be six? I think it's uh, it's enough to keep some people uh, home. I I truly believe that. I mean, because you just do the math and uh, and figure it out. And there are some who are making uh, more money now uh, than they were uh, when they were working. So I think there needs to be a little bit of an incentive to go back to work if uh, if you can, and um, but enough uh, to supplement uh, what uh, what is needed to pay your rent and um, and pay your mortgage. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Ann Wallace Allen, VT Digger. Hi, Ethan. Can you guys hear me? We yes. Can. Um, Governor, um, I wanted to ask you if you think that Congress and then Trump will approve additional aid for state governments, um, because I know that state and also municipal governments are going to be looking for some extra cash. And if it's not from the feds, what's the game plan if Vermont doesn't see additional money or if Vermont doesn't receive flexibility to use money to address its budget hole? Yeah, that's the multi-billion dollar question that's uh, going on in Washington as we speak. Um, you know, I've said before, um, flexibility would be nice if we could have more of that. Additional dollars would be, be welcome. <clears throat> but if we didn't have any of that, We'll figure it out. We'll live within our means. So we've, uh, you know, we've got some good news coming in terms of closing out uh, the the year end. Uh, we're better off than I, uh, we had all thought we were going to be. Uh, so we know it's going to be a, a tough fiscal year 21, uh, but we're also showing uh, that we can take some steps. 
uh, to uh, to preserve uh, the revenue and uh, make our way through this. So I'm, uh, I'm confident we'll make it through, uh, but it would be nice to have more flexibility uh, as well as uh, more resource, more dollars uh, in the upcoming package. I believe, um, I do believe that they will, I think most Republicans and Democrats alike um, can see the merits in, in more flexibility, and I think we'll see that in the next package. Whether we'll see any, any dollars uh, flowing, uh, new dollars for uh, budgets, uh, uh, I think that's 50-50 at this point. When you say there, you know, there are no, there's debt um, that we can take. What what well, are we've the done, We've see? done them, uh, and you know, we've already done the the first uh, quarter of the budget. Um, we uh, uh, we don't have any. There's no non-essential travel. We're limiting uh, hiring. There's a hiring freeze. Uh, the administration. Uh, I've uh, I've canceled any. Uh, increases in, in wages for uh, our uh, our staff uh, and, uh, and and many others have have as well. Whether it's the Attorney General, Secretary of State, um, and uh, so we've taken a number of steps that have preserved some of the revenue uh, at this point in time. So uh, we've done that uh, already in this first quarter, and uh, we'll continue to do that uh, through the the rest of the uh, the fiscal year. I guess I was wondering what people can expect to see in the future in terms of those kind of cutbacks. I guess we won't know until we know what we have to deal with. We don't even have the cards dealt with a, to us yet. Uh, so uh, we'll learn more as the uh, legislature gets back into session and things should be clearer by then. Uh, but for me to speculate at this point uh, uh, wouldn't be helpful. Okay, thanks. Joe Gresser, the Barton Chronicle. Hello, Governor. I believe this is a question for Secretary Smith. Um, once again, it's about uh, the death of Mr. Johnson. And um, I'd like to know if the Department of Corrections has already taken any personnel action at all um, in reaction to the events of December 6th and 7th. Joe, the answer is no to that question, and uh, I think what the Department of Correction is doing is wait, waiting for the completion of the external investigation, including the investigation that I have uh, uh, commissioned through the Department of, uh, uh, through uh, Drought Frackman and Martin, and I believe they are moving towards um, an, inter uh, an investigation through the Department of uh, Personnel Management as well. Um, but I, um, I'll have to follow up on that as well. But the answer to your question is no. Thank you very much. Aaron Patenko, BT Digger. Ethan, uh, can you tell me how many more people we have? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, three more. Three more. We're in overtime here. Yep. Go ahead, Aaron. Aaron, star six. Didn't mean to scare you off. All right, um, we'll move on to Joel from the Burlington Free Press. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, I don't have any questions today, oddly enough. I think it's lunchtime. Perfect. And, uh, <laughs> well, I, I think my esteemed colleague, uh, uh, well, we'll leave it at that. But, it may uh, be a question but, from the free press. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you all take care. Thank you, Joel. Thanks, Joel. Olivia Lyons, WCAX. Hi. I do have a couple questions. So the state says that they will assist schools financially in hiring additional staff for health and safety checks, but some schools may shut down for a lack of staff. So why is the state accepting this? You know, how many schools do you anticipate may shut down, plus this puts a massive strain on those surrounding schools with plans created for their current students? So how will the state help those schools? Um, uh, Secretary French, uh, Olivia, do you, have, do you have specific schools that have said that they were shut, shutting down? No, but it was mentioned before by Secretary French that there may be some schools that do shut down for lack of staff.
Yeah, hi, Olivia. Yeah, you know, I was just referring to um, you know staff being an important consideration for schools to maintain uh, their operations and reopen. And uh, you know, our objective is to ensure that continuity that schools can stay open. So, in terms of additional state resources, at this point there are none. Uh, but school districts do have access to federal supports to help uh, with the COVID relief, including funding for staff. Okay. Um, and then on a different note, through Efficiency Vermont, there is a grant to improve air quality in schools, and about 220 of the 350 eligible schools showed interest in this. So is the state going to offer additional funding to make building improvements for COVID, including air handling systems beyond the Efficiency Vermont grant program? It's not clear to me yet. Um, you know, the state and the legislature, we work with the legislature to uh, to de uh, dedicate, I think it's $6.5 million of CRF funding towards uh, this HVAC program. I think we all acknowledge it's uh, toe in the water, and so to speak, um, but there are, there are a number of priorities related to reopening school and HVAC is one of them. Um, I know, uh, I think Thursday I'm um, meeting with the House Education Committee and we'll hear from a number of superintendents around the state in terms of uh, what, what they're uh, thinking about in terms of their costs and so forth. So I know the financial considerations uh, will remain a significant concern for, for not only for us and for the legislature. All right, thank you. Well, okay, I think that's it. that's it. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you again on Friday.